I think that means we're live. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Uh, welcome to the Art of Partnerships. Before we begin, I would like to do a land acknowledgement. We recognize and respect that New Westminster is on the unceded and unsurrendered land of the Halkamalem speaking peoples. We acknowledge that colonial colonialism has made invisible their histories and connections to the land. And I I guess personally would like to add that while the city is on um, this learning journey, I myself am on a learning journey and I'm grateful um, for all of the opportunities to understand the history and um, the trauma that um, Indigenous families have uh, experienced. And I am appreciative of the fact that my learning will continue and I'm not sure that there will be an end to it um, because there is a lot to, to learn. So thank you for giving me a, an opportunity to do that. I'm going to, in one moment, I'm going to introduce um, my colleague, Jessica Schneider, who's going to be co-hosting this evening. Before I do that, I just wanted to do a couple of uh, house, housekeeping notes. Um, I think that I'm not sure if people are on Zoom or Facebook, but I, I just want to let you know that we do have uh, closed captioning available, and it, that is at the bottom of the Zoom screen under live transcript. If you click on that, you will be able to find closed captioning. Um, if you would like to ask questions, we will have a Q&A portion um, of this uh, event. And so please feel free to add your questions in the um, Q&A. Uh, box that's also at the bottom of the screen. Unfortunately, we won't be taking questions from Facebook tonight, but the link is in the comments section of Facebook Live uh, where you can click on that and access the Zoom call and be able to put your questions there. If you don't have a question, but you're really interested in another question that someone else has asked, please vote it up so that we get to it. And um, I think that might be it. If something else comes up, we'll get to it. But um, I think what I'd like to do right now is, is uh, introduce Jessica Schneider, the executive director of the Massey Theatre Society. Um, Jessica and I have been working closely together, I would say, for the past few years. And um, I won't speak for her, but I am very excited that we are on the other side of this process and now can move ahead in our partnership between the city and the Massey Theatre Society. And um, Jessica, I'm going to throw it over to you. I think we can do that. We can just throw it back and forth between us. We can be real casual, um, but I'm going to pass it over to you and um, uh, ask you for some opening comments as well. Thank you, Mary, and thank you to the city for making this opportunity for us to share a little bit of this journey and our story and our hopes and aspirations uh, for our organization and for the community as well that um, that will be realized through this facility. Um, I also want to mention that we're going to be uh, joined later by uh, two of our fantastic um, cultural and programming development staff, Ronnie Dean Harris, who's our Indigenous Cultural Development Director at the Massey Theatre Society, and Fleur Sweetman, who is our pro Performing Arts Program Coordinator um, at the Massey Theatre Society as well. So uh, they'll be able to speak a little bit more into how we're going to bring everything to life um, and also do the, the hard and the good work that we need to do to make this a really meaningful and inclusive place uh, for everybody. Mm -hmm. So I know um, some people don't know probably what we're even talking about, and we don't know who's there. So we'll have a chance to um, to to jump in uh, with some slides uh, that, that will just show images of what uh, the space is that we're talking about, and also um, a jumping off point for the future and our conversation. So um, I believe this is where we are. So great. Thank you. Um, 
Yeah, so so uh, you'll see right at the top, right off the bat, we've got our new um, sort of transitional identity that we're looking at for this space. Uh, that That's not a new name for the Massey Theatre, but it's a new name for the complex that uh, I guess is formerly known as the Massey Wing of NWSS. Um, that name is, is now a thing of the past. And so it's time to establish um, a kind of an intention for this place. And, um, we felt that uh, the idea of eighth and eight is is really great as a as a location as a, a clear navigation point. It's, it's simple and accessible, but also, um, you know, there's so much imagery and and symbolism in the number eight as well, and the two circles and and the idea of circular um, community development and circular journeys that people are on in terms of um, in in initiating creativity and then coming back to showcase it and share it and 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 continue the circle um, of sharing that we do in the, in the arts and culture so uh, we also want landed on the name creative spaces because we really want to make it clear that uh, that the the primary goal for this facility is going to be to be uh, able to create whether at, at any at any point along your journey as a creative person and all people are creative so um, we just want to make that primary in people's minds. Um, the next slide, please, Sophie. Uh, so as some people will know, the, the large Massey Theatre is actually still at the center of this larger complex. This is the Massey Theatre for anyone who's not familiar with it. It's uh, 1,260 seats with a, a big uh, stage that can do all sorts of production and performance. Uh, it's not just a mu music venue. It's not just a theatrical venue. It does all those things quite well. And um, over the years, the society has been operating it uh, on behalf of the school district for nearly 40 years. The theater opened in 1949. So it's of a particular era. Um, it was named uh, uh, during the era where Vincent Massey was the governor general of Canada. And uh, he established a lot of the institutions across the country that helped to form, um, I guess, what he thought a, a positive cultural identity would be at the time, which was post-World War II. Unfortunately, it's important to note that Vincent Massey was, was um, was uh, inclined towards ra racist views. Um, he believed in a Eurocentric vision for Canada and, uh, and, and really built the infrastructure and the um, cultural um, support network, I guess, in that way. So as a result, um, you know, the, the facility doesn't support all art forms um, when it's just the theater in an optimal way. Um, it's fairly formal. It requires a fair bit of, um, uh, economic backing to put large productions on and most of the tickets are sold. Um, so it automatically comes with some economic barriers and it's important for us to start to uh, pull down those barriers. So it's a real focus to see how we can uh, build on, I think, a, a, a really positive uh, community history associated with, with use of the Massey Theatre through the school district, but also through a lot of our wonderful community organizations who have used it so well, uh, and, you know, a fantastic array of international artists who, it, who use the stage. It's a great facility, but it also does need to become more and more accessible as we step into a future that's more inclusive and, um, and that really uh, provides facilities for everyone. Um, but it remains at the heart of the facility. If we move on to the next slide, you can see what the rest of the complex is, which is really where our jumping off point is for our future opportunities. And this is the, um, the sort of footprint of, of what uh, the city has taken possession of that and leased to the society and a long-term agreement. Um, of the studio spaces that are marked with Studio 1A, 1B, and 1C are former school spaces. So um, the sort of strip right down the center from the stage to the Plaskett Gallery was the space that we were operating within before and using the school spaces um, you know, for larger events or on weekends and times when the school wasn't using them. But they weren't um, really made in a way that uh, professional artists or arts organizations or community art or arts organizations could easily come in and um, and do their work uh, because they were classrooms and so now with the new high school 
we were able to turn those rooms into other uh, kind of functions and also um, sort of drive what's possible in the theater with meeting and gathering spaces around it um, so that it is no longer the only amenity within the building. On the next slide, you'll see some of the purposes. So uh, we've done some improvements already over the summer. And so one of the former classrooms is now Studio 1A and it's intended as a dance and music rehearsal space. It's quite large, it's over 1700 square feet and um, it's the floor is suspended. So it's easy for dancers to use. We've got equipment and more equipment to come with sound systems and dance floor and all the amenities that uh, dancers would need, but also there's storage. There'll be uh, musician chairs and music stands and things like that available for uh, music rehearsals. And um, we're hoping that we'll be able to activate um, community creation as well as support uh, productions being re rehearsed and developed within the theater facility. Uh, Studio 1B is designed as a black box. Um, it isn't completed yet, but we've done quite a bit of work as you can see. It's painted out to black. It has its initial equipment already installed. Um, and it's going to be really great because it's much smaller. It will hold probably 60 to 90 seats, depending on the configuration quite comfortably, which is a size that isn't currently available in New Westminster. Um, and it's going to be great for things like one person performances, uh, dialogue events and, and sessions where there might be an um, interaction and a, and a projected display uh, creation and rehearsal also um, performing arts for youth and community members to start and, and experiment and explore with the artists that come in uh, to our facility to perform. So we'll see a lot of exchange between uh, artists that are going to be on the main stage, but also we'll see community generated work. And one really exciting opportunity with this kind of space is to create um, immersive projection uh, for performances. Um, we're installing a number of projectors and we'll be able to um, help artists create and learn to create uh, projection work that is quite detailed and, and well-developed. And in order to do that, we'll have residencies and intensives and workshops uh, so that people can learn how to activate and use those kinds of facilities and, and equipment um, to support their projects. In the next slide, I'll show you what we've done with uh, so far with the small gymnasium, which is down at the end of the long hallway adjacent to the theater for anyone who's familiar. Um, it will be uh, not a gym anymore, though the floor is excellent, so we'll be leaving that, but we'll be removing the uh, basketball hoops and, and we see a lot of community opportunity here. So um, it can hold around 400 people seated. And so it's an excellent space for um, things like community dances and um, even some small banquets and things like that. This particular image is from a, a craft market that we did with the Arts Council put on um, for us uh, during our open house. So it's easy to access. It's a nice big space. It's got uh, some basic equipment and more to come. It also, though, will, will begin to evolve as a large studio space um, for dance and music as well. So big dance companies um, can, can be in there and, and we'll have the equipment to support that as well as our local symphony and visiting large ensembles that, that are of the scale to, to perform on the stage, but also need a lot of other space outside of the stage for, for their rehearsals and uh, for their waiting time. So that's going to be really great. And then the lobby space has been cleaned up and uh, refloored and things like that. And we're using it more and more as an event space of its own when the theater is not uh, in performance. So we're seeing some opportunities for hosting um, events. Um, we have some business people that are going to be networking and doing things in there and also um, room for food and beverage uh, programs, uh, whether they be delivered by us or by other community uh, members who, who are making things. And it is adjacent to the Plaskett Gallery, which was on the next slide. Um, and the Plaskett Gallery is right beside the lobby, which is a lovely space um, to, to host artists and to have them um, able to be in there. One of the things that's quite different from the past is that we can actually have installations now um, because there's more space to support the lobby. 
Um, it doesn't just need to be um, a gallery that exhibits uh, paintings in the future. So there's quite a lot of opportunity for more exhibition by visual artists than there were in the past, um, though it isn't a rated gallery um, it, you know, anywhere in the facility yet. So looking at climate controls, lighting, um, all of those kinds of improvements over the next few years and into the future. Um, but again, it's a, it's a lot of space. Uh, and that's not all. So if we move on to the um, next slide, you see the floor plan for the second floor. Um, and the second floor, I know there's a, a, an accessibility upgrade required and, and we'll be working with the city to, to deal with that and make sure that the second floor is gonna be accessible by an elevator um, in the future. And it's got a number of rooms as well. So that was in the past, strictly our balcony level. We didn't have a lobby. Uh, we just had a corridor, the balcony, no bathrooms. Um, you know, these are all things that need to be done to increase um, utilization. But it does have um, Studio 2A, which is a really lovely uh, meeting room and rehearsal space. It could be used either way. Um, Studio B is currently um, envisioned as a staff support area, so for lunchroom and, and staff meetings. Uh, the audio lab in 2C is going to be a recording space for um, all kinds of audio, whether it be um, uh, eventually, I think we'll get it to where it could actually be a recording space for albums, but initially probably podcasts, pod plays, um, music rehearsal, and uh, initial sort of exploration of recording. Um, and then the video lab is right next to it for anybody who remembers the second floor. It used to be the, the drama classroom on the second floor. Uh, it's now a video lab and it's got uh, lighting, cameras, uh, sound equipment, mixing and editing equipment. And what's really cool is that all these spaces are going to be interactive um, through internet technology. So they actually will be able to, you could record in multiple spaces, including the main stage or any of the studios at the same time and, and collect all of that recorded material in, um, in the same database and then be able to easily cut it and splice it together, project it, uh, whatever the project involves. So I think it'll be really interesting for artists who work in media, as well as performing artists who are um, doing the, the pandemic pivot still and, and putting more and more of their content online. So if it's a performing artist who doesn't need a large stage and a large audience, we now have amenities to support them um, as they enter into um, the market and deliver on different platforms than they did in the past. And that's really a, a big lesson that we've learned through the pandemic, um, which was that um, we have to have more infrastructure than, than simply performance space um, because we weren't allowed to do that very much for quite a while. And this is gonna really help people build the skills and the capacity um, and also connect with each other and enjoy that, that creative expression that happens in the digital world now. If we look at the next slides, we'll see actually a look inside the video lab. Um, we haven't got all the equipment that we're waiting for. We're, we're stuck in the supply chain problem that a lot of um, projects are right now with some, some items offshore, but, uh, but we have initially the lighting, we've got multiple cameras, you can't see them all in this image, some instruments, um, and then um, the audio uh, equipment. And in the lower photo, you can see some youth that were actually using it um, at the open house. So they were actually um, exploring multiple cameras, switching between shots and able to check out what their friends were doing at the same time. Um, and we do really hope to, to continue to have a strong relationship with the school, the high school, especially um, where we can have extracurricular uh, programs for them to come on over. And the next slide, I believe, is our wrap up slide where, well, here we're, this is Ronnie, you're going to meet him later, but he was actually painting a mural at the open house in this uh, photo. So, you know, we've, we've kind of cleaned up uh, the space now and put some new carpeting and paint in but now it's time you know as Ronnie's demonstrating here to have artists in to actually start to interpret um, this this facility and and show our community and work with our community to bring it to life so it's a nice place to uh, to wrap up the slideshow <laughs> thank you 
Thanks, Jessica. Um, I, I mean, I can, I have been uh, lucky enough to have a couple of tours through the building and I know that there's, there's more. I mean, there is more that you have, you haven't even um, shown or, or spoken about this evening. So um, yeah. I think it's really exciting. I think that what we should do is um, maybe talk about the, the partnership aspect between yeah. the city and Massey uh, Theater Society and how that came to be. And um, you know, the benefits um, and the differences in this kind of an arrangement um, versus what you might see in another municipality. And I mean, I, I guess I'll just speak on behalf of the city. What really attracted me to doing something different was the additional capacity that um, an organization like yourselves has to do things that the city cannot do um, or or the fact that you can be quite nimble um, in the ways that you might want to address what's going on in our community or what's going on in the arts or um, it, the city doesn't tend to do those things very quickly. We have different skills. And, um, and so it was really for me that the idea of partnering with an organization that um, has so much experience and also um, longevity in the community, I felt that that was um, going to be a real benefit to the city. Not, not It's not simply, um, I guess there's, I, I guess I would describe the partnership as having a much deeper, meaningful um, uh, outcomes than you might have when you just decide to do business with someone in your community. I, I wonder what, what you think, you know, how, how that affected you in the early days of this discussion. Yeah, well, it's certainly been a, a long journey. I, I think if maybe some of the people that are out there on this uh, kind of are aware of, of the journey that this has been, but but um, yeah, I mean, certainly longevity or let's call it um, resiliency, you know, is a real feature of, of a not-for-profit arts organization, I would say, but most not-for-profits. <laughs> um, I really believe in not-for-profit. I think um, what, it, what it's all about is direct community input. So, um, you know, the board is volu volunteers from the community and has been all along, um, but then we are specialists in a sector. So whether it be, you know, a healthcare organization or a social work organization or a children's service organization, their staff are people who do that, right? And, and then the community is who advises their staff about what matters in that community. And then there are all those other funders and the ability to fundraise um, that, you know, and direct and target, I suppose, where the budgets go, um, that really are differences between a government um, organization and, and, and a, a smaller not-for-profit. And so, yeah, so, so for example, through the pandemic, you know, we were able to, to kind of take on all the opportunities that were available for the arts. And the timing was perfect because we were in this approaching this transition into this facility as well, this timing wise, but we were able to raise money for all that equipment mm -hmm. from other levels of government, as well as from the private sector and donations that we could receive um, in order to have it in and ready to go, you know, so, so um, yeah, I mean, we're vulnerable in some ways, in ways that a municipality is less vulnerable, but it, at the same time, we have opportunities um, and we can sort of react and respond to what um, what we need to do to get through it in a, in a little bit more flexible way. And, and the city um, has, you know, has managed that remarkably well, but certainly, you know, um, the choices that have to be made are just quite different, you know, because we're mm -hmm. just focused. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really been great also to to combine the sustain sustainability or the long-term stability of a city with the bricks and mortar of the facility and then all the nimbleness of a not-for-profit at the same time and I think that's what's uh, really great about the, the relationship that we managed to create is that it draws on the strengths of both rather than being a business transaction like mm -hmm. here's your building you pay us this um, you know, we're going to go through this together and we're going to save, I think, our community a lot of money um, by doing it together, you know, um, and and be, be able to keep it operational as well while we go through the developments and the changes, which is going to be really important for the long term users. 
and for audience members, you know, that have uh, that have a relationship to coming there. Mm -hmm. um, before we bring uh, Fleur and Ronnie on, the other thing I wanted to just um, highlight for people was um, the process of developing the agreement between the city and the society. I think that it was quite unique and um, you probably have heard of lots of other examples in your, in your industry, but um, I would say as far as the city goes, it was very um, un a very unique way to actually develop what our partnership was going to look like. And for those, you know, maybe many people don't know, but what the city did is we decided we want to have this partnership. We want to have this agreement with Massey Theatre Society. So we should craft it as partners, as opposed to the city also in isolation of the society putting something together and saying, what do you think? How is this? Um, and I think, you know, we, we um, created a task force that was a balanced between um, the city and the society. And we kind of hashed out what an agreement would, would look like that would actually um, highlight the strengths of both organizations, but also protect each other mm -hmm. from you know, from situations. So I wonder how, what you thought of that process. I, I thought it was quite um, unique. And um, um, I think, you know, I'm quite proud of what we, what came out of it. I'm just wondering what that process was like for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because that process, I think came in the process that ultimately got us here. It was only three or four years ago. Um, prior to that, yeah, there was a, process gap, you know, there were lots of decisions that had been made by various councils and boards of education as well, along the way, um, that, you know, that left the society sort of like, okay, but, you know, political winds can change. And are, are we actually going where that, that group of people have said we were, um, you know, keeping the record, holding the holding that space was a challenge until we got that process in place. And actually I want to credit you for that, um, Councillor Trentanu, because that made all the difference. It made it so that I'll just highlight, I guess, what it was for me, so that the staff people didn't have to, um, you know, navigate it kind of on their own in their jobs, but there was policy there to guide there was a body there to reference to go back to and it didn't ever become a power struggle you know between Todd Ayotte who's the manager of community arts and theater services he, he had counsel there with him as we went through it oops mm -hmm. am I cutting out no I I thought I was frozen but maybe okay. you were frozen but now we're both here so okay. it's all good yeah so so that so that sort of um multiple layers of I guess you know, decision makers um, were, were really helpful. Um, also, um, yeah, being able to engage the board directly in it. So that same issue, I wasn't alone, um, you know, navigating or negotiating with the city by myself. <laughs> um, it just, and also um, there, there's been sort of dispute resolution or just a knowledge that we need, this needs to serve both. And that's gonna take change mm -hmm. on both sides of the discussion. Um, we, we can't inhabit this big municipal facility without an awareness of what municipal strategies and goals need to be and requirements actually legal requirements need to be. Um, mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times not for profits, because that world isn't our world, the, the government world, um, we don't we don't understand, you know, wh why the guidelines or the rules, it seems rigid, it takes too long, it's too, it changes too much, you know. Um, and so, yeah, having a process where you're actually understanding each other, and how you think what sort of cycles you plan on, all of that stuff, and then aligning it, mm -hmm. you know, and we were able to do that, I think, and that finally is what got it done. Um, you know, mm -hmm. there's so many so many forces kind of that can fracture fracture these kinds of things because it's very long term and it's mm -hmm. a big commitment from both sides yeah. yeah especially when the organizations are both quite different you know like you have i some like i sometimes i would think it was almost a bit like the david and goliath you know like the big huge monster organization and then the small nonprofit both doing really important incredible work but 
coming from a different structure that could actually um, not work together, Mm -hmm. you know, and and so it it was, um, I think it was really quite amazing that we were able to kind of come through that. I'm I'm keeping mind of the time, Jessica, it's seven. And I, I, I want to bring Fleur and Ronnie on. I don't want us to not, I, I'm actually, <laughs> don't take this in the wrong way, but I'm really interested in hearing from them <laughs> more I than, too. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to bring them on. But before we do, I just, um, I would like to just remind people, I see that there are a few questions popping up in the Q and A box. So I just want to remind you to go ahead and do that, vote them up or, or ask your own question. Um, and um, I think Jessica, you're going to introduce Fleur and Ronnie, right? Yeah. Okay. I will. So I'm going to ask you to do that, please. Okay. Well, it's really important to me to make sure everybody knows that um, I'm not the Massey Theater Society. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I've had a, a lot of of a stewardship role, getting through all these bumpy waves. But but I have there's an incredible staff team there that actually do just a tremendous amount of work. Um, about four years ago, we got involved uh, with Ronnie. Dean Harris, here he is. And uh, at that time, Ronnie didn't even live here in New Westminster, but he does now. And um, and Ronnie has been just instrumental in, in figuring out what the values can be that could be really groundbreaking, I think, and really, really important um, for making this a community space that that matters in, in this day and age and in this moment. So, um, and Fleur just joined us in September she has a fantastic background in performing arts um, as a classical musician, but also as a programmer at a number of different places, um, Place des Arts and the Turning Point Ensemble and Musica Intima in management and arts organizations. So we're just really um, going to benefit a lot from how Fleur can help us advance um, those programs and, and aim, you know, help our organizations that, that are in the theater um, develop. But um, but yeah, I'd, I'd like to start with Ronnie because, um, because he's been really forging uh, a, quite a lot of um, understanding and pathways and relationships for the organization. And Ronnie, if that's okay, if you just jump in and share some of what you've been doing. Sure. Uh, first off, just want to thank everybody for all your work on this. It's amazing to, um, uh, like you said, to be on the other side of this from going from ideation to just watching people walk around in this space has been pretty awesome, especially coming out of, um, uh, you know, this health crisis and uh, kind of the earth crisis, the cascade of crises that we've been sort of faced with in the last couple of years. Um, so uh, that's, it's, it's, it's awesome to, to sort of witness that transformation in that space. Um, uh, my introduction, my name is Ronnie Dean Harris. Uh, I've been a hip-hop artist and by the name of Oz 12 for many years. Uh, my family's come from Stalo, Stockley, and Inca Capital Territories, and most locally, just over that way. Uh, my great-grandfather is Chief Coquitlam, where, where the town of Coquitlam gets its name from. Um, I grew up in Kwantlen and Musqueam Territory, so I grew up just up the river here in Albion, um, B.C., and then I grew up in like my teenage years in, in Musqueam. And so uh, this being, you know, traditional territory of, you know, of all those territories, plus KC, where I spent a lot of time, uh, New West for me as a human being, I've lived here twice now. This is my second time living here, but my family has always spent a lot of time here. Um, and since contact, our people have spent a lot of time here, not just with interaction with colonization, but um, we've traveled here to gather during since that time. And so that's sort of been the basis of my re- research relationship I like to have with, like to call that uh, with Massey is that um, when it came time to work with Massey, it was like at the time my life was focused on just kind of understanding uh, the reality of history and our relationships in a new way. And so that came from just looking at the data and looking at what was what what the stories were that have been told. So um, here in New West, I mean, it's the oldest settlements in um, you know in British Columbia. Um, there's a lot of stories here. Uh, we're 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 hardwired for narrative, and we're connected by stories more than we are politics. And so when we look at how we're trying to create this kinship between us and the and a relationship and reconciliation, we get bogged down in the, 
we get bogged down in the political viewpoints. And so for me, I think stories have been the basis of how I see it. Uh, a place that tells stories should function in that way um, in the community. And so um, in, in that research, we've looked at really like the traditional place names, the, um, the ancient stories here, the stories of creation, the stories of history, the stories of the relationships and kinships with governance and with colonization, but also with like events, like there's been some really uh, benchmark events that have happened in this, in this space um, that those stories still need to be told. And so um, it's been great to have a relationship with the city, uh, with, the, with, with uh, people at Heritage and um, being able to access documents and um, to create relationships with the people like KC, Coquitlam, Kwantlen, Musqueam, and all else around those, uh, those also in the diaspora from their traditional territories living here in New West. Um, uh, those things for me gives me a lot of great hope. And so um, in, the, in that research phase, like for us, the design, I guess, comes in, in looking at tools and spaces that sort of lend to um, resurgence and revitalization of indigenous culture. So recording spaces, performance spaces, research spaces um, that from from my knowledge of the projects that I've worked on as a as a as a as a musician as a as a performer, um, we're we're doing all those things. We're researching. We're trying to understand our culture. We're trying to reinterpret history. We're trying to reinterpret cosmology. And so, um, you know, even just ideating with Jessica back in the days, like yeah, we, we have this, and yeah, we need this. And like this would be very vital to uh, the work that needs to to happen here in New West. And so from design goes to futurisms, right? So what are the futurisms that we've had so far? I think um, uh, creating those relationships have been one. So like really like beyond the band office, I call it, and, 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 and beyond the politic is like really looking at families that were here at contact, right? And so what does that relationship look like? Um, it's been a lot of listening. Um, and that's a that's a huge part of it. And so um, for us, that also started with, I guess, even just last week, or was it two weeks ago now, um, we did a ceremony at Massey Theater, where we did a food offering to um, the graves and the people on site. So um, for us, that kind of reshapes the relationship that the Massey can have, not just um, with the community or human beings, but also with uh, with the land and with uh, with spirit in the way that our ancestors did. So we're lucky enough to have uh, the Stogan family, who are one of the original families from here in New West, come and do the ceremony here at the space. So um, things like this for me are, are, are very reactivational. So I don't know when the last time that ever happened in that space was. Could be however long since 1859, maybe. Right. So. Um, futurisms are for us right now is like a press record right now. So we want to get people, elders, storytellers in that space, recording language, recording stories, um, using that space to also um, activate a narrative strategy on the history, the, 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 the way that the city and the, 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 the community members understand indigeneity in the space and also that relationship of what that work looks like. So uh, I'm very lucky to, that Jessica understands that process of what these tools of revitalization might look like. Whereas I think um, a part of our goal now is to make the rest of the community understand it that might not see it as a tangible asset to the community, that work. Um, and then for me also is like looking at kinship reactivation. So in that space, looking at how that space interacts with land, water, the animals and the plants around it and sort of, uh, and, and really looking at what that kinship looks like in the future. So the shape of performance, having these new performance spaces, the gym, you know, lends itself to powwows and potlatches or funerals if needed. So um, for me, all these spaces form meets function. And so uh, when we're looking at maybe creating indigenous arts here at Schwamath, right? At the, at the, 
this original place name of well, one of the original place names here in the US, um, creating actual Shwamath art at Shwamath up at the top of that hill. Um, I think, you know, now that these doors are open and that these spaces have been activated, um, the ancestors have been fed there. Uh, for me, that's like official. It's pretty official. So I'm looking forward to uh, talking with more of the community members and having them come in um, and really working a lot and focusing on what young people want and, uh, and pairing them up with those knowledge keepers. And then like from that, I always call it totemize it. So a place that tells stories totemizes things. So once we have this understanding, once we have this collection of knowledge, you sing it, dance it, paint it, weave it, carve it, whatever, muralize it, whatever we got to do to tell that story, to pass it on to the next generation. And so um, I'm really thankful to be a part of this journey um, um, at any capacity. And of course, like, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to bring our communities into this space and to see what the future is going to be like. And we've got those great team members, Flores here, and I'm so excited that, you know, to, um, to see what we can do with, with this new canoe. So uh, thanks for letting me speak. And I hope that um, I see, see you all in real life really soon. Thanks. Thanks, Ron. And I, and I really want to just um, share that, um, you know, it's a, it's a blessing. Uh, Ronnie is stretched in many directions and also is managing or holding many, many relationships on our all of our behalf, um, which is a lot of energy and, and love and care. And um, people have been going through a lot through the pandemic and, and other, other, you know, ongoing issues. Um, it's been quite a difficult time, exceptionally difficult time, I think, for Indigenous community members. And I do want to really appreciate, you know, all the time that that is going coming back out to the rest of the larger community from the Indigenous community and from you, Ronnie. So it's it's really appreciated and valued. Thank you. Well, I mean, this is a huge part too. like this kind of space is part of the healing. And I think that's mm -hmm. what's lacking is that you know, in the city, you have to contend with real estate and capitalism, right? So then our arts end up kind of filling spaces and seats. Um, this is the kind of space the city has been wishing for, for indigenous space. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, that that's going to help with this healing and give us that place to kind of express yes. what's inside. I mean, for me, I know like all this organizational stuff and all the life living stuff, like for me as an artist, like I need if I can't wrap it, I can't understand it. So I'm hoping that this is a place where people can come and try things out and like, you know, it, it feels safe to really share those, mm -hmm. you, these vulnerable stories that we all have right now. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, I know that there's a lot of, uh, a lot of opportunity, not just for our community. I think I really feel that these tools will be valuable to all the communities in New Westminster, which I think is so that was the, that was a big focus as well. I'm like, well, yeah. if these tools work for us, the, let's identify the small communities that are here that could also use these tools, um, yeah. and just and let's get them in there. So we really want to see people see themselves in there. So um, yeah, thank you for listening to me again. That's great. Okay, well, we we're gonna move over to Fleur now, and um, and then save a little bit of time for questions too. So. Um, Fleur, can you share some of what we've been talking about, about um, sort of the big umbrella that, that we're jumping in with uh, for programming? Sure. So, um, yeah, my job is really fun because now I get to come and you've done all the work and I just get to program all the fun stuff that's going to happen here, which is really exciting. Um, so basically what we're thinking about doing is we're going to be starting running a lot of like pilot programs that in the new year um, to just explore these spaces to see what works best for the community and we're going to be dividing it up into kind of like three parts so we'll have registered programs um, these can be classes workshops um, intensives uh, all kinds of um, camps these sort of things that people can register and pay uh, to come and, and take a take a class um, then we're the second part would be like arts and community programs so these can be um, 
residencies, performances, um, all kinds of um, different uh, things that allow people just to create and, and develop their, their craft. And the other part we'll be exploring will be partnerships. So where other arts organizations can come in into the space to have a space to have their programs and we can work with them and, and um, to, to build these, the, the different programs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great because um, it's similar to how we've used the theater, but it just has just so many more sort of tentacles, right? And um, so, yeah, there'll always be the ability for people to just rent, show up, do their thing, use the, the facilities as they need to, but there'll also be chances for, you know, for us to partner and to, um, you know, create or innovate, I suppose, with artists and with people that we're bringing in. Um, and then classes and, and ways we really I'm really with the relationship to the high school we all feel that pull of like all those students there where do they go after school who wants to make something who wants to connect and I think like the opportunity for wellness is just huge right for well-being and to increase that by having doors open a place to be place to socialize and possibly express yourself or explore some deeper thoughts and feelings. Um, so we, we also have a relationship with Family Place um, and, and that's increasing. Fleur, do you want to talk about how we're engaging with Family Place and, and sort of um, young children too? Sure. And parents? Yeah, right now we have Family Place uh, that are coming um, three mornings a week. They come, they do a drop-in, it's free. So anyone in the community can come. Um, they have uh, different arts, crafts, um, play activities. Um, they're all, uh, you know, it's lots of things to do for the for young families here, um, and it's all free to to come. So that's yeah, that's uh, running already, and we're mm -hmm. hoping that we'll be able to um, connect. You know, maybe the high school music and and dance students can come over and engage directly with the toddlers, right, during a family place program. So again, looking at those proximities and just how a community can start to move, you know, um, move around and in contact with each other. So um, I hope that that expresses really that sort of openness that we're we're shooting for. It's um, you know, we're really trying to have a lot of different programs that will reach all the different demographics of people and and really finding out i mean that's why we're going to be running a lot of pilot programs so we'll figure out what works and what doesn't in the next few months and and then be able to build from there yeah and we're also seeing I, the return of performances so you know that ripples out as well sorry mary go ahead no i i, I don't know how to actually express this but like just listening to your plans you know your vision and and uh dreams for the this facility i mean you know it feels like ronnie's really grounding um where we go from and then i really liked that fleur said that we're going to do pilots like so that means we're going to try things out you know we're going to figure out what works for the community what does the community need what how can they come into this building and and experience the best of themselves and the best of the building. And I, I feel like there's just the opportunities are like limitless. It's so exciting. I, I don't know. I mean, I wish I could express myself a bit better, but I, I agree. I really feel I agree, it. I really yeah. feel it. It's very limited, like really anything is possible. And I think coming out of the pandemic too, I think we don't know really where things are going. Mm -hmm. And I think that having just the opportunity to be very flexible and, and mm -hmm. seeing what works for people, I think what people need now is, is maybe different than what people needed a year or two years Absolutely. ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. I, I feel like we could probably, I we're really containing ourselves. I yeah. sense this. we're really containing this conversation and trying to like, just stick to the script. Yeah. Um, but there are a few questions. Okay. So I'm going to just ask one of the questions and then we can, you know, go off again if, if we need to. Um, so there is a question here. Um, Jessica, are you considering a volunteer artist involvement partnership similar to the artistic hub program that presentation house has put in place performing artists bank volunteer hours towards using the facility for free? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think we have anything formed that's specifically like that, but we do have, uh, 
we have a couple of different models that we're going to roll out. One is this partnership idea. So figuring out how we request or, or invite those partnerships is a piece of what we have to get in place for the new year. Um, and that might be the kind of vehicle that this person is asking about, uh, but definitely. And then, and then Ronnie uh, definitely has a concept around um, supporting, you know, uh, the recording and supporting of elders and mm. this press record now concept, you know, while, while people still are with us to share um, and having people support that work as as technicians and do you want to describe that Ron? yeah I, I mean for me i've kind of look, been looking at this idea of like um i mean a lot of these facilities also come up for me being a, my needs when i was young what would i have needed in a community as a hip-hop artist is recording space right even the simplest recording space or just the place to make noise so in return <laughs> for that like um in some of the programs that i've done we've done like, oh, so you want to use the recording equipment? Well, then you're going to have to record this elder then as to, to, you know, to sort of log time as an exchange, but also just a, a chance to just put them together. Yeah. Right. So for me, the, 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 the my pilot program that I'm thinking of is press record now is that um, even in the time that we've done this, like we, I've lost elders that we were going to have come sit with us. Right. So like for us, like press record now is vital. So um yeah, that's definitely helping to like get some some um, hmm. young people doing some of the work. Um, and I, I can kind of branch off on this as well as that uh, some of the space that we've created is comes from that time uh, during the pandemic when we were looking at pivoting and a lot of us as musicians were doing, you know, performances in our offices or wherever um, and needing that space, but also looking at us at, at facilities that will make easier um, vocation uh, online. So let's say someone's auntie wants to do a weaving workshop, but doesn't really know how to do a Zoom or whatever. We can have a space with cameras and someone can push the button for her and, and, and do that interaction as well. So um, that, that interface with elders and youth for me is really important of how we shape a lot of this. And so um, I don't know if we can get as far as like logging hours, but definitely shaping it so that we're getting young people and, 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 and knowledge keepers uh, in a room together mm -hmm. um, with, with the equipment and with the facilities is definitely something that was built kind of that, that I, I, I went into this with. So, yeah. Yeah. But uh, absolutely, there are going to be many, many hours and days to fill. So, um, you know, we will be looking for, for community proposals, I guess, from individuals and other organizations as well to, to help us. And I've been, yeah, I've been like really wanting to like tell the community too, is like, if you know of a community group that identifies that is artistic in a way or needs gathering space, if you know of individual artists in the community that need that space to activate, that need space to be noisy, I know that for musicians and artists and poets and and dancers and whatever kind of performers you need space to move your arms and like I, I lived in basements a lot of my life up like this and rehearsed like this for many <laughs> years so if you know those people you you know like let them know that we're doing this work here mm -hmm. and send them to us so that we can um, help let 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 them help us shape this community in this space because yeah. we really like as I keep saying we want the community to see themselves in the space so those rural communities of musicians that we don't know of that aren't mainstream that aren't we want to hear from them and we want to give them space mm -hmm. for that so um, that's what I can say about that yeah great Ronnie thank another? you for that invitation um, uh, I, I think that's really important. I, and I think yeah. we are going to have to keep saying that, like, just keep telling yeah. people, tell us, yeah. tell us what you want, tell us what you need. Yeah. Um, I'm going to go to another question from um, someone who I know, <laughs> who has said, Mary, maybe you need to engage in some arts to express yourself. <laughs> so yes, I could do I don't know any of that. I would like to try hip hop. I could do modern dance. I, I think I would try anything um, because I think as you get, I will say personally, as you get older and slightly beaten down by life, wow. some of that artistic creativity and expression 
dies mm -hmm. and it would be lovely to be able to reinvigorate that. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to take that, that suggestion out. And I'll so, add to that hold too. On. Okay. Yeah. Well, the real, there is a real question. Oh, I think okay. that was Under that question. One. Gotcha. the real question. <laughs> uh, what team Massey, this is for you. What upcoming programs or performances are you feeling most excited about? Ah. Mm. Well, I'm really, really proud of, of our main stage performances, all of them. Like they're quite eclectic. Ishkwe is amazing, like uh, avant-garde, Cree, uh, multidisciplinary artist. Um, we're gonna be so fortunate that, that she's coming here, but also Sean Majumder, like you might think mm -hmm. he's that goofy guy from CBC, but he's actually like an incredible thinker and uh, a really interesting, um, like he's a, a an interracial person so he he has a way of looking at racial politics that is just like blows my mind so that show is going to be amazing but also the arts club's big huge production of noises off like that's going to like stretch the the stage in a kind of amazing way it's it's going to be one of the biggest shows that has ever been on the massey stage right like the whole set revolves um in that production so it's it's massive and magical it's going to be great um but, you know, I think the real big opportunity that we're all focused on is all the other spaces and um, and just having community in the building every day, you know, that's like something we've always wanted. And when you have 1200 seats, that doesn't happen every day. You know, there are always big events, big events, different audience, different audience every night, you know, um, big audiences. But now we can build deeper relationships than than what you might get with one show. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, I have to say that's that's the thing that's the new for us, and that's really. What do you two think? I agree. I think I was just thinking back to when we had the open house and how exciting it was just to be have so many people and meet people from the community and all these different small performances that were happening, and you know having the family place come in and seeing like the kids and the parents and all those kind of like just makes you it's 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 it feels so nice it feels so real to be yeah Ron experiencing that yeah I mean um, I'm excited to really see some um, you know indigenous gatherings here I think. Um, hopefully we can get a powwow night or you know a west coast you know they kind of got west coast powwow stuff like that um of course i have lots of friends in the indigenous music industry and so i'm excited to bring as many of them as possible and also um you know just really getting to like speaking language there and getting weaving and carving yeah. and uh just people just doing things and really seeing what kind of arts and craft stuff that the community has because there's just like the 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 diversity of the new community really excites me yeah um uh, there's so many different communities here that really excite me and i'm just you know i think we're going to be able to i hope that, that that once we put those calls out to those people and they, they start to need space to come and fill it that's great thank you thanks for that for sharing that we have um a couple of questions left we're almost out of time i'm gonna i'm gonna there's two questions that aren't similar but i'm gonna kind of put them together um so and and i've heard this question a lot um is about the hours of access to the building like what does access look like and then there's another question about a liquor license so let's put liquor <laughs> license and access together because of course they go together yeah. and can you just speak to that a little bit as well sure um they they have well there's so much space that it's possible to have liquor going on in some space without it being in all space which i think is also important <laughs> um, but sure, there could be big parties in there sometimes. Um, we do think we're going to do full building festivals at times, which, you know, where we might see, um, you know, different kinds of uh, textures or flavors of events happening throughout the day, leading up to maybe a bash at the end of the night or something. I don't know. But um, 
that that's all stuff we have to navigate when we're thinking about you know what different people want out of the space right or need for their for their mental wellness you know like the recovery community and the and the party at the same time is can be a challenge so um but right now it's actually the the building is still zoned as a school building so until the it's rezoned we can't have a full-time liquor license in a school facility um but we do get special occasions licenses and um and we do enjoy you know hosting with the full array of of food and beverages maybe a wine festival would be great you know i'd love to do an exchange with like new zealand and have artists indigenous artists from new zealand and wines over here but you know it's not as automatic as you might think to put all those things together with with indigenous artists here too so we have to we have to you know listen to each other on these things um around the uh, hours of access in the new year we are going to have you know a full kind of program schedule that's going to allow us to open um a lot more of the time so we've been renovating like doing improvements and not trying to also run the facility fully uh, but we're hoping by mid-january that we will have um hours we'll have programs in the mornings and and then at noon we'll open just generally for people to just come in and you know hang out and look at art and stuff like that and and also programs and then after school and to the evening for um activities classes workshops social events um most nights i mean our goal is like something like nine to eleven um six or seven days a week so that's our goal we have to figure out you know the the way we're going to finance that um because we have to have at least two or three things going on at once to sort of pay to pay to be open so working that out and then working it out around um you know the theater shows as well so it's, it's a bit of a dance we're doing with each other and we have like a process that we're going through to sort of wrestle wrestle it all into shape <laughs> but yeah i mean we have a lofty goal and we'll be starting in the new year with as close to it as we can get thank you it's uh we're we're past our time now i i guess the last thing i want to do is um remind people and myself to to be patient as well because yeah. I know that a lot of us know that this has gone on for a long time. It took a long time to get here, but so now we're here, now we're in a new phase and this phase mm -hmm. is going to take some time. And, and I think we need to just be patient and, and appreciate the opportunities that are going to come um, from and think about them. the work you do and think about them like not just say it's this and this and this but like mm -hmm. like yes we're going to think about what makes the most sense in this building but generally we're trying to have an open building that people can come and create and and be welcome in mm -hmm. all people yeah um so that's going to take time and i wish that we were already there but we're not we have Pandemic. to take the time <laughs> yeah there's things going on um so I guess I just wanted to add that because I often am impatient and and I want to mm. just resolve that that yes it's okay it's all going to happen it's exciting and it takes time to get there. Absolutely. Um, right. So I just want to thank you all for for doing this um, with me and with the city. Um, I think we could do this again. I think there's lots and lots to talk about and I think this is a good way for people to gain an understanding of what the hopes and dreams are of this facility and what it's gonna to mean to our community. Um, but I really just also wanna just honor and, and respect the time that you've put into to getting here um, as a nonprofit organization um, that you know has been working really hard at this for a long time. So thank you for all your contributions and I'm super excited about this future for our community. I think it's amazing. You can you can say something, Jessica. It doesn't have to or or Ronnie or Fleur. I don't have to be the last word. I think that's a great note to end on. <laughs> but everybody call us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not all at once. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you. Oh.